guys, and thank you all for being here today. We're really excited to share the research that we're doing that goes along with my PhD dissertation, which focuses on ecological interactions between American pikas and mountain goats. And if you stick around, we have some trivia for you all. Um, so yeah, let's get started. First off, um, who is from Moab? Raise your hand. Awesome. Everybody else is visiting. Raise your hand. Cool. Well, welcome. Some of you may be familiar with the LaSalle Mountains and American pikas and mountain goats, but for those of you that are not, I'll just take you kind of through everything and then we'll, they'll talk about pika ecology, mountain goat ecology, and then we'll wrap it up with um, some science. Okay, so species interactions or animal interactions are really important to um, the integrity and the sustainability of ecosystems. So the way in which different species interact is really important and thus it is important for us to understand them so that we can conserve them and preserve them uh, for the future because we all really like to experience these habitats and see these animals running around uh, being happy. And so that is the impetus for my PhD research. Okay, so mountain goats and American pikas. This is an American pika. This is obviously a mountain goat. <laughs> um, but they are high alpine specialists that exist, again, at high alpines. Um, and they're both herbivores and they're nat actually naturally co occurring through parts of their ranges. So to illustrate this co-occurrence, here we have a map of North America, and if we overlay the pikas distribution, we can see that pikas kind of start up here in British Columbia, they, their populations come down into the U.S., and they go about as south as the eastern Sierras or into northern New Mexico. And the native range for the mountain goat overlaps a little bit with pikas in British Columbia, and then they're also native to Washington, Idaho, and parts of Montana. So, like I said, they naturally co-occur in some areas. Um, in these areas, they do coexist, so their co-evolution with each other has likely resulted in a form and a way for them to coexist with each other. But what is interesting is that through human um, transplant efforts, the mountain goat's native range, um, or the mountain goat's range has been pushed farther south than was previously noted. Um, and so you can see there's much more overlap between pikas and mountain goats in these gold and orange areas. And these areas here down in the south are of particular interest because both of these species are predicted to be vulnerable to the effects of climate change, right? So they're both cold adapted species. Climate change isn't really helpful for that. Um, so these southern populations are of particular interest. And if you see Utah, we have a pretty representative number of these overlapping populations with pikas and introduced mountain goats. And so we're lucky enough to study here in the LaSalle Mountains. Um, and so the LaSalle's are pretty unique. I'm sure a lot of you know. They are a sky island ecosystem that is surrounded by red rock canyon lands, 40 miles on each side. It's really beautiful, especially if you get to the top. Um, and once you're at the top, yeah, you, you can see how isolated it is. So if you imagine being a goat or a pika, you're pretty restricted to this range. So there's really nowhere else for these animals to disperse to. And so in 2013, when mountain goats were introduced to the LaSalle's, these pikas are now sharing space with these mountain goats. And the LaSalle's are a really unique area for us to conduct this research. One, no one has ever looked at these interactions before, even in their native range. And because of the ease of access of the LaSalle's, we're able to do this type of research. So like in Alaska, it would be much harder 
uh, around mm -hmm. Alaska in British Columbia. Um, so we're grateful to have the LaSalle's as our study area. And now, <laughs> this is actually a photo that Holly took. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Holly to tell you about parties. Oh, yeah, yeah. If it doesn't. Fall. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Holly. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on the American pika. Um, so, uh, <laughs> pikas are small. They're about the size of a, of a potato, as you can see in this diagram. Um, and they're alpine mammals, so they usually thrive in elevations about 9,000 feet and above. Um, they are weighing usually about 100 grams, which is about three and a half ounces. So they are, like I said, relatively small. Um, they are closely related to rabbits. That's the, their closest um, relative, which is interesting on that. And then, uh, like Mallory mentioned, they are herbivores, so they feed on plant material, um, typically grasses and forbs. Um, it's their main food intake. So, pikas have very distinct and high-pitched calls. Um, these calls are made usually for territorial reasons or for alarm reasons, like if they're if there's a predator in the area. Uh, we're gonna see if we can get this video to play. This will show like a cute little pikey call here. Uh, I don't think this will work. Okay, so if you've ever heard a pika or if you've ever been in the mountains, usually about like I said, nine thousand feet or above, um, if you hear just a like or similar call that's yeah and 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 they can have like kind of slightly different calls depending on the area um which is which is super neat um so pikas are unique also because they are non-migratory and they don't um hibernate so they do rely on food caches called hay piles um that they collect during the spring and summer months to get through the winter um, and this is a picture of like a hay pile in its hair in its house area where they where they reside. Um, so the investment in hay piles is pretty extensive. Um, they can uh, cache about sixty five pounds of food. For, so for a small mammal that size, that's that's quite a large amount of food. Um, and this equals about thirteen thousand hay trips within this small like spring and summer months. I told you want me to play this video? Oh yeah, if you can, yeah. So we can hear the call, it makes it all over. <laughs> so another interesting fact is pikas also eat their own poop. Um, they make two different kinds of poop. So one is like a peppercorn consistency and size. And then another one is a little bit less round, kind of more disgusting looking. But this poop that they can, that they do eat, is actually six, six times more nutritious than the grasses and forbs that they collect. Um, so this is a very important uh, part of their diet. So, trivia, trivia time. Um, and you guys can just like raise your hand or whatever you feel comfortable with. If nobody feels comfortable answering, like, we can do it a different way too, but um, so which animal is more closely related to a pika? So I'll give you a couple answers here. So wood rat, rabbit, squirrel, or potato. <laughs> um, does anybody want to answer, or do you want to? Uh, go ahead. Rabbit. Perfect. Ooh. That's great. You want to get it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the next one: a potato-sized pika collects 62 pounds of food in three months. How much food would this be in human terms? So we'll give you a couple different answers here. So 200 pounds, 2,000 pounds, 20,000 pounds, or 200,000 pounds. So I didn't answer this one in our slide, but if anybody wants to take a guess on how much. If you like sized up a pika to the size of a human? Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, yes. Oh. Is it 20,000? You're right. That's oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. And so this is equal to 5,000 trips to the grocery store in three months for humans. So that's like insane. And each of those trips, if you were to carry like two to three heads of lettuce in your mouth, that would be <laughs> what this tiny, tiny uh, mammal is having to do. So it's, it's great. Awesome. And it's really impressive. Um, so pikas cache some toxic plants in their hay piles. Um, why do you guys think they would do that? So I'll give you some options here as well. So the toxins act as a preservative to keep the plants fresh during the winter. They like the way the toxins taste. 
The toxins help pikas stay warm over the winter, and the toxins help the pikas sleep at night. All right, so we didn't go over this one either, but does anybody want to take a guess? Sure, I'll say number one. You're right. So the toxins do act as a preservative um, to keep to help keep their hay piles fresh during the winter. Um, so that was all on the awesome pika, but I'll pass it over to Elena, and she'll talk to you guys about mountain goats. Yeah. So I'll just be giving you guys a little background to get about them. Uh, mountain goats, Latin name, Oriamnos americanus. They are one of the few very rare uh, high alpine mammals. Uh, they are actually the most understudied large mammal in America, uh, which makes our research kind of like a unique and valuable insight into these rarely studied interactions about these kind of like unknown creatures. And they are really unique for a lot of reasons. They are the only uh, species and in their genus, and their genus is fairly unrelated to quite a few others. So uh, they have a lot of unique things going on that are interesting to research. <laughs> well, here's a little guy learning to hop around. Uh, a few characteristics that set mountain goats apart. Uh, Number one is that they are super adept at traversing mountainous terrain. Uh, they mainly dwell in these kind of escape terrain area, areas that are really rocky, steep, cliffy areas that they can use to kind of have a safe place from other predators around. And one of their most unique adaptations is this globe and hook here. That is kind of what uh, is analogous to an extension of your two biggest toes. And so it's kind of like very tactile and dexterous. They probably look super hard, but they actually have kind of a spongy interior. So they have like an outside exterior and then on the bottom it's slightly concave and they can kind of like grip and cup the rock with that. So that is a super interesting adaptation. They're commonly confused actually <laughs> with bighorn sheep. Uh, even to my boyfriend who thought that was what I was studying for quite a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> But while well, the corn sheep are also have those little cloven hooves and also live in alpine habitats, they actually occupy usually a lower elevation than these mountain goats and are quite different for a number of other obvious re re reasons. Uh, a little bit about their resource selection. Mountain goats are mainly grazers and they eat grass and forbs. And they're also interesting for being altitudinal migrants. So they actually do a fair amount of migration between the seasons between elevations. They start off, uh, when winter comes, they migrate to lower elevations where they mainly feed on more like woody and fibrous forbs. And then in the summer, they kind of go up with the snow line and move up to those kind of tasty grasses and forbs that you might imagine. Uh, one reason, although the grasses and forbs are always more nutritious for them, it's just simply too hard for them to have the energy costs of moving through deep snow. So that is the reason for moving lower and kind of snacking on that less palatable woody plants. Um, and they have a number of really unique cold adaptations. It's one of the most interesting aspects of their physiology is those cold adaptations. They kind of have that really big shaggy coat. It's actually a two layer coat. There's kind of a fleecy soft layer that occupies the first three to five inches. And then there's larger, more fibrous guard hairs that poke through. They're about each inches long, generally. And they're actually hollow, so they can trap air kind of close to the skin and keep that warm for them. Um, they also have another cold adaptation. Uh, they have many, but this is possibly my favorite, <laughs> is that they have a much thicker dermal layer on their posterior, which is a fancy way of saying that they have a big callus on their butt. <laughs> and that is thought to help uh, insulate them from the snow and then also possibly to protect them from sneak attacks from other mountain goats and aggressive encounters because uh, that appears to be one of their favorite things to do is go poke each other in the butt. <laughs> uh, so I thought that was a really funny one. Um, and yeah, that's some interesting facts about them. Um, in general, they're kind of one of the more interest-specifically aggressive species, which is to say that they have a lot of aggressive interactions within their species. They have a really specific hierarchy in their herds, which is actually female-dominated. 
So adult females are actually always at the top, kind of regardless of body size, um, just kind of due to age and other factors that we're not aware of. Trivia time, everybody's favorite. But first of all, which would you, which of these would you guys guess is most closely related to mountain goats? A. Domestic goats. B. Uh, the Himalayan goral. C. Bighorn sheep. Or D. Domestic sheep. Does anybody have a guess? Yeah, you. I'm gonna say the Himalayan goat. Yes, you would be correct. <laughs> it is. Himalayan goral, uh, they are the mountain goats, one of the mountain goats most closest relatives. Uh, they are both members of the antelope goat tribe, tribe Rupi, Rupi Caprini. Um, domestic goats are not actually closely related to mountain goats at all. They do exist within the larger family Bovidae, but that's quite a general classification. Uh, hold questions till the end, please, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, they are not quite what we think of as a goat at all. Uh, they're more similar in many ways to African antelopes, uh, but not quite really closely related to those either. Thus, this kind of weird classification of like antelope goat tribes. Uh, so this is one of the most difficult aspects of mountain goat research is sexing mountain goats. Uh, they're not very sexually dimorphic, which is a fancy word we used to say uh, there's not many visible differences between the uh, sexes. So if you guys had to take a guess, is this goat that is taking a cheeky peek into this car, <coughs> is this goat Philly or Nanny? Anyone want to take a brave guess? <laughs> yeah. Nanny? That is a good guess. But it is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> we can still give you a high chew. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of distinctive characteristics you can use to sex mountain goats. Uh, uh, this is less reliable, but they usually have a bigger hump around their shoulders. You can kind of see that like pronounced part right there. The most reliable way is usually to look at their horns. Uh, billy goats have thicker bases that are usually uh, kind of a baseline is to say that the bases are usually larger than their eyes. I didn't, never particularly like that. That can be kind of misleading as you can see. It's like kind of difficult to judge the size there. But they're usually like thicker in general along kind of like the whole horn. And they kind of have that gentle curve backwards. They're not straight up. They kind of gently curve backwards. And uh, if you were to see the uh, front facing profile of the scope, the bases would probably appear to be closer together than a nanny would be. Uh, and this is a younger Billy. He doesn't have particularly that kind of like long horse like face that you see as Billy's mature more. He has kind of like a shorter face right there. And so you guys can try your luck again. Is this a Billy or a nanny? Would you guys guess? Don't be shy, anybody. So what's the name? Nanny. Nanny? You would be correct. <laughs> this is a nanny. Um, <laughs> you can kind of see here, this is a straight on profile, but you've got these skinnier horns. And they actually kind of go more straight up and then kink backwards. So if you were to see them in profile like that earlier goat, they would look more like boop instead of like a gentle backwards curve. And you kind of have like a larger space between the bases. Um, you can also often judge them from their posture. This is kind of a typical nursing posture. Um, and then often people judge them based on their urination postures. Billies kind of do more of a stretch out. And nannies do like a classic squat posture. And so related to the other questions, which of these goats would you guys say is not the same as the others? Mm -hmm. Guys can take a second to take it all in. Let's hmm. see. You're saying C? You guys would be correct, actually. Yeah, you got it straight on. I don't know who got it. Who said it? Yeah. High choose for everybody. I know. I'm like, <laughs> Roll up in the air. Everyone. Yeah, you guys can see uh, he's kind of got those thicker squatter horns, uh, and these guys kind of have the thinner ones. They also have this like characteristic kind of splay to them uh, that the leaves do not have. 
Okay, so now that you know a little bit more about the ecology of pikas and mountain goats, we'll kind of dive into the more sciencey part, which is what we get to do. Um, for my PhD research, we're lucky enough to ask this question, what are the ecological interactions between these two species? And again, this has never been studied before, so we're super excited about it. Um, and so there's three different possibilities that we might find once my PhD is hopefully finished one day. Um, one is uh, the potential for competition. The second is resource partitioning. And then the third is facilitation. And these are kind of confusing and abstract, so we will illustrate them here with my little cartoons. So for competition to occur, you have to have two species that are both focusing on or capitalizing on the same limited resource. And so over time, both species will feed on it, drive it down, which results in a reduced feeding opportunity for the less competitive species. So that's one option. The second is resource partitioning. And so this one typically happens when you have one species focusing on one resource like these Forbes and then the mountain goat focusing on this grass. And so when this happens, it results in no interaction um, through resource competition or resource partitioning. And so if we find this, it may seem like a moot answer, but it is still an answer in general and, and it's an answer that um, managers can use to better manage these species. And then finally, facilitation. This one occurs when we have, again, these two species, and we have the larger herbivore that eats this grass and creates this grazing lawn where we have this short, nutritious grass that the pica can then take advantage of. And then, through the deposition of their fecal matter and urine, they return nutrients onto the landscape, which helps regenerate this forage resulting in enhanced feeding opportunities for both of these species. And so how are we going to figure all this out? I'll kind of go into some of the methods we're using, but first I kind of want to just show that you too can go out and see evidence of these potential interactions. Um, this is actually off of Man's Peak in the Little Cells, and if you go out there, just keep your eyes on these talus patches. So this is where pikas live. And then they, like Holly said, they feed on grasses and forbs in the summer. Then they go out and collect hay for the winter. And so while they're going out to feed and collect hay, they're running back and forth between the talus edge and this meadow. And if you look closely, you can see that there is mountain goat scat right next to the talus edge. So if you go hiking and you don't see a pika and you don't see a mountain goat, you can still find evidence of this space use overlap that's going on. So how will we measure this space use overlap? We are going to do it with a combination of behavioral observations on the American pika in the La Salle's and we are lucky enough to work with the Division of Wildlife, um, so they have collared some goats in the La Salle's and given me access to them so I'll be able to analyze their GPS collar data. And specifically how we do this, this will kind of give you a day in the life of us doing behavior observations. So watch this um, circle here. Hopefully this video will play. If it doesn't, I will be sad. <laughs> and I don't think it's going to play. Well, that's really, oh wait. Oh no. Anyway, so we sit kind of away from the talus and if this video worked, you would see a pika pop her head up, run out into the meadow, and she, usually, she stops right around here and she picks up grass and runs back. So we record the distance that she ran from the talus edge. And that kind of gives us an idea of the amount of space use that these animals are using outside of the talus edge. 
And then for the mountain goats, like I said, we have this GPS collar data, and so if we combine that with the running data from the pikas, we send me back to the computer and I define these talus edges where pikas are, and then I buffer them by, um, we call it the giving up distance, so the maximum distance that the pikas are running from the talus edge. So this gold portion, like I said, uh, shows us the space use for pikas, and then what we can do with the GPS data is analyze it by comparing mountain goat use GPS points in blue to randomly generated available points on the landscape that they may or may not have used because of uh, GPS lag. But what this lets us do is it gives us an idea of whether or not mountain goats are preferentially seeking out uh, these talus edges. And previous studies have showed that talus edges are actually more nutritious than these meadowed areas, and it's largely due to pikas defecating and urinating and bringing their hay piles onto the talus. Um, so this is something that we're going to try to analyze in the LaSalle's. And then lastly, if I haven't bored you enough, um, we're measuring pika and mountain goat impacts to grasses and forbs because how one species impacts grasses and forbs will affect the availability of food for the other animal. And the way we do that here in the LaSalle's is we're going out and installing 10 exclosure sites, so grazing exclosure sites, which all kind of look like this. So we have three different plots that are each a meter by a meter squared. We have one open control plot, we have another partial plot, and then we have a fully exposed plot. So what the control does is it allows both species to feed, the partial allows just the pika to feed, and then the full excludes both species. And so what this allows us to do is we let them graze, we let the plants grow, and then at the end of the summer we clip the vegetation then we take it to the lab and dry it and weigh it. And when we compare the dry weight in each plot, we're able to do some math and see how pikas and goats are impacting the above ground grasses and forbs. And this is what it looks like in real life. It's extremely heavy, so if you would like to help us, we are taking volunteers. <laughs> um, this front one. It's just made of cattle panel, and then we wrap it with chicken wire to keep the pikas and other small mammals out. And then there's the open control plot, and then the partial plot just doesn't have the chicken wire wrapped around it. And before we sign off, um, I just want to acknowledge that this is a very collaborative effort with the U.S. Forest Service, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, and uh, the U Utah State University. Without this collaborative effort. This would not exist, so thank you. And then thank you to Jackie, Holly, Elena, and my co-advisor, Johanna Varner. Without these guys, it would also not be possible. And then finally, thanks to my funders, particularly the Canyonlands Natural History Association.